Good evening, everyone, and welcome back uh, to one of our uh, webinars that Vets for Ukraine 2022 is organizing for you. Um, webinars done by the Vets for the Vets. So uh, Vets for Ukraine 2022 is a group of veterinary specialists who have joined together to offer uh, to veterinarians, uh, students and nurses um, high-valued uh, uh, webinars for free on different topics, including soft tissue surgery, anesthesia, um, neurology, um, dermatology, internal medicine, oncology, and so on. So we are uh, receiving more and more requests to um, take part to this initiative by new specialists. And we will soon have with us specialists in uh, wildlife or uh, also exotics. Um, and also uh, we will have some cardiologists uh, so many, many uh, specialists, therefore, stay tuned, stay with us. And in particular, help us, because what we are doing, let's remember why we are all here and why we are doing this, is because we would like to raise funds to help uh, people in difficulties uh, in Ukraine, in Ukraine um, uh, affected by the terrible war. And we are collecting donations to, uh, on behalf of the Red British, uh, sorry, of the uh, British Red Cross, to uh, sustain people in difficulties, to um, for food, for clean water, to repair um, schools, hospitals, to allow people to stay, allow for families to stay in contact. So many different reasons to. Uh, uh, offer our donations, so uh, please um, do be, be, be generous and uh, give us a little bit of um, donation. Remember, we are uh, going now live on four different platforms. We are live on Facebook, on the uh, Vetonia group. We are live on LinkedIn. We are live on YouTube, but also on Twitter. And what is most important is uh, to reach uh, the aim that we um, we have planned, so to reach as many as much as much as money as possible, we need you to share our link. So uh, and that's why I would like to ask Paolo, my helper, to uh, send uh, a sharing countdown for us. So, um, just because I haven't said it yet, so the link where you should click to make your donation is www.justgiving.com slash vets for Ukraine. And before, we, um, when I was waiting to start the live, I, I just was checking my emails and uh, I would like to share with you one of these emails that I received from the Just Giving uh, website, so the website that uh, is helping us organizing the donations. And I would just like to, let's see if I manage to show you. So uh, we receive this, and I hope everyone can see it. This is, uh, uh, it says 5% uh, amazing fun fundraiser. So basically with your help, we are, we are a, they say we are a top 5% fundraiser. So uh, your Vets for Ukraine 2022 page was one of the most successful Just Giving pages last month. Out of thousands of fundraisers, you were in the top 5%. Congratulations on raising so much for the British Red Cross Society. You are an absolute hero. So you are heroes because you are helping us in this fundraising. And therefore, I would like to invite you to spread wide and far the word and uh, just ask your friends to donate either a little amount, so a few, few pounds, few euros, because, you know, every little 
helps every day that counts and it can make a huge difference from someone which, who is in difficulties. So um, remember www.justgiving.com slash vets for Ukraine. Uh, here below you can see you can see the link you can click on. Um, the webinar of today will be on neurology, so I would like now to introduce uh, our speaker. Um, our speaker is Simona Radaelli. Simona is uh, going to present, uh, like, uh, she will go, she will be talking about epileptic seizures, diagnosis and management. And I would like now to let her in, in the studio, so that she can introduce herself and maybe also uh, we can exchange um, two words all together. So, Simona, are you here? Hello. Hi, Simona. Hi, well, <laughs> how are you? you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Okay. And first of all, thank you so much to you, Apollo, to organ for organizing all this. It's absolutely amazing. And the amount of time that you're investing for this is really, really great. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, um, accepting my contribution to your cause. Absolutely. So you're very welcome. It's always a pleasure. And you said, you know, we are always very happy when specialists do join us. So Simona, do you want to tell our friends how do we know each other? It might be well, we go back um, a couple of years, I think. <laughs> also, we met. Really fair, you know? <laughs> we met at uni. We were, um, yeah, we were together at uni. Oh, yeah. We were, yeah, in the same group of students in the same year. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And then how did you, because then we lost each other. So how did you, because you are a specialist in neurology. So yeah. how, how was your um, path in your life with neurology? How did you so, go out? Uh, yeah, uh, since we're going back a couple of years, everything wasn't as structured as it is now in terms of training and uh, residency and everything. So, but I was lucky, I managed to get a scholarship and and spend a year to the States after I finished university. And I started a neurology internship. I worked alongside some great neurologists at the time. And then I moved back to Europe to do my residency. I did the residency in Germany. Um, German yeah. then. I did speak German at the time. Yeah, I had, I had great support from, from the students as well that were working with us, but uh, yeah, I needed to understand and speak a bit of German to. Yeah, Where about you Germany was your residency? Hanover. Hanover. Uh, north. Because you, know, north. Yeah, because you know, I've done my residency, my surgery residency in um, in Munich as well. So. Oh wow. So, yeah, yeah. I've done actually. I've done everything from the internship to to the residency and then senior lecturer at the University of Munich, which was where. I, I guess you remember Chiara, no? Chiara Giordano. So yes. she, and I remember she was, uh, I remember I went to Munich because Chiara uh, did a, an Erasmus there. And she okay. used to tell me about her Erasmus in, in, uh -huh. in Munich. And then I said, oh, let's do that. And then I, I did the same. And then from there, I found the internship and the residency. So, yeah, so anyway, so this is just to say that we are at the vet school together. And yeah, we will. And we are talking about now nearly good 30 years ago now. <laughs> okay, do you want to introduce what you are going to talk? So you yeah. are going to talk about um, epileptic seizures. Yeah, um, that's the topic I've chosen for tonight. <clears throat> because um, I, I think it's a topic that uh, it's a disease that a lot of um, vets, GP vets, um, encounter. Um, it's the most common neurological condition. So, and um, yeah, so just to give basic, really simple, it's going to be um, hopefully quite straightforward, simple, usable type of, um, so nothing fancy in it, just a bit of guidelines and um, a bit of, um, yeah, just a bit of simple definitions on seizures and and how to um, how to do the, the diagnosis and the differentials and the treatment. So um, yeah, that's with my, the aim for tonight uh, in terms of, of webinar. And Simona, when you will um, when you will uh, share your screen, do you want to 
do you want us to see you or do you want to us to see only your presentation what do you prefer it's absolutely as as it's easier for you guys to, okay. to do okay. so and i have no preference thank you yeah. okay so i think we are um, ready so if you are ready so let's let's rock yeah, i'm ready to go yeah good luck and see you, you later <laughs> bye bye Okay, here we go. So, um, as as mentioned, as um, Daniela Scandley um, mentioned when she introduced me, we're going to talk about epilepsy uh, diagnosing and management. Um, this is um, um, a slide that I want to just a bit of housekeeping. Um, th there isn't much of much surgical content in my slide, uh, but um, in my presentation, but there are a few uh, videos of animals having seizures. So because this is this webinar is direct to veterinary professionals that unfortunately um, are, are used or have seen uh, animal seizuring um, or miss most of them in their career. So if you are not a veterinary professional and you're watching this, uh, just uh, make sure you, that you don't find this type of content sensitive, in which case, please don't, don't watch this, this, this webinar. Thank you. So let's start. Uh, just a bit of definitions. Uh, so we know that uh, uh, we talk about the same thing, basically. So just very briefly. So in general, we define a seizure, um, an event that is, um, short lasting and transient. So a manifestation that the animal is showing that um, doesn't last a very long time, let's say self-limiting. We normally use um, the definition seizure for epileptic seizures. So in, in, in epileptic seizures, this event, so this short lasting um, event is a manifestation of a synchronous, synchronous activity in the brain. So the neurons in the brain are discharging um, and the clinical signs, they're, they're discharging, of course, in an abnormal way, an expected way. And this and the manifestation is the epileptic seizure. Um, we def ep epilepsy as such is instead a chronic condition. So the epi epilepsy is the tendency um, to have reoccurrent unprovoked seizures. And so an animal is affected by epilepsy when the, the seizures reoccur over time. Uh, we, uh, oh, the classification of seizures has been, um, has been, has changed a lot of time along, along during the last years um, uh, in human medicine. And of course, the classification that we use in vet medicine, it uh, comes a little bit from um, the human one. Um, uh, uh, let me say it's probably slightly simplified um, because, of course, the manifestation, the seizure manifestations in human medicine are quite di diverse and more complex than we, we see in our animals. So one of the classifications that we use is based on um, the manifestation of the seizures, so how they appear, their appearance. Um, and we have, we could divide, divide them in three big groups, focal seizures, generalized seizures, and focal with secondary generalization. So um, it, when focal seizures, we normally have um, the clinical signs that are um, the result of an abnormal activity um, and of, of a group of neurons in, in a local area, um, in a localized area in the brain. And, the, and therefore, the clinical signs are lateralized. Inter, in, in, with generalized, generalized seizures, um, of course, uh, the, this abnormal activity involves both uh, the cerebral hemispheres. Um, and therefore, it's, it's bilateral. Um, there are the generalized seizures are divided in different types as well, depending on their, their manifestation. Um, when I speak to the owners and I ask them to describe generalized seizures, what they normally mention um, is that the animal is, in, in the generalized tonic chronic, the animal is unconscious. Um, this, is, this is, again, a description of the, what we call the convulsive generalized seizures. 
the animal loses consciousness, uh, is in lateral recumbency. There is normally loss of urines and feces, and uh, the animal cannot be distracted. The, anim the owner can't wake it up. So th it's a question I always ask them. If you try to wake up your pet or to get the attention of the pet, does it, does it turn towards you? Does it listen to you? Um, so this, this is fairly common in, um, as, as generalized convulsive uh, seizure. Um, normally, these seizures uh, last, in the books, they say less than five minutes, and they happen more often uh, during the sleep, when the animal is asleep. And um, especially with generalized seizures, we have often postictal signs. So after the, the seizure, normally the animal um, it is st still shows some uh, uh, neurological abnormalities. And we are going to see all these in details later. And then we have the focus seizure with secondary generalization. This is actually the most common type of seizure, but often the owners do not recognize the focal signs and then um, can tell them really apart and they remember mainly the, generalized, um, the generalization of the seizure. Another type of classification that we do is based on etiology and based on the cause uh, of seizures. Um, so we can have, two big groups, extracranial, intracranial uh, causes. Um, when we talk about extracranial causes, um, we uh, we define the, the epilepsy, the recurrent seizures as reactive. So we say it, it's a reactive epilepsy, reactive to a metabolic problem or to an intoxication, for example. Um, intracranial seizures are two types. One type is um, due to um, a structural disease of the brain, uh, cerebral vascular accident, tumor, and therefore we um, talk about secondary epilepsy. And then if we uh, don't find any uh, cause of the seizure, we talk about idiopathic epilepsy, which is a diagnosis of exclusion of other causes. So, um, when an animal has a seizure because of um, an extracranial uh, condition, normally the seizures are generalized um, and they have a pretty high frequency. Uh, the, the clinical exam of the animal can be abnormal and, there, and also the blood results, especially if it's a metabolic condition. It's potentially reversible. The seizures are potentially reversible um, if we treat successfully um, the cause of the seizure. Um, that doesn't mean that the animal doesn't need um, anti-epileptic treatment, but it means that we will have to treat something else alongside, of course, um, the anti-epileptic uh, medications. In, when we have um, a secondary epilepsy, especially if it's a focal lesion, in the hemispheres, um, the seizure can be partial or can be partial with generalization, secondary generalization. Um, the frequency changes, it depends on, law, or, on uh, the intracranial pressure or the size of the, of, of the lesion and, and all that. And the animal in between the, the seizures, which is the interictal period, as an abnormal neurological examination. In most of these cases, we will need advanced diagnostic tests to reach a definite diagnosis. Um, idiopathic epilepsy is uh, a functional abnormality of, of, the, of the neurons of the brain. And we know very well that there is um, brain predisposition. There are, there are several breeds that are predisposed to idiopathic epilepsy. We are going to see a, a short list of them. The animal can be normal in between the seizures. So in the inter interictal period, the animal can have a completely normal neurological examination. Uh, age is between six months and six years of age, normally. And um, it, the generalized seizures are more common than partial seizures with idiopathic epilepsy. Um, as I said earlier, the, um, with idiopathic epilepsy, the diagnosis is um, of exclusion. And um, we, in terms of diagnostic tests, we have, we have put 
um, there are three uh, tiers of the confidence level um, that will make us, again, confident that if we're talking about idiopathic epilepsy. In the first tier, um, we um, the animal has, um, of course, has the in age between six months and, and six years. Um, the neuro exam is normal in between the seizure, the, yeah, in the interictal periods, and has suffered from two or more unprovoked seizures. Um, and when we um, do the blood, the, blo the bloods, um, hematology and biochemistry, urines, and also um, bile acid stimulation tests or ammonia, they are all normal. In the second tier, we add to all these uh, points also normal MRI and normal C MRI or CT and normal CSF, we prefer MRI. Um, a normal CSF. In the third year, there is also a normal um, interictal um, EEG, electroencephalogram. Uh, unfortunately, um, we don't have a really standardized protocol for the use of EEG in, um, in, in animals um, so far. Uh, brick predisposition I mentioned before, uh, you have a, a good list, um, Border Collie, German Shepherds, um, Italia Spinoni, um, they, these are some of the breeds are predisposed to um, idiopathic epilepsy. So how do they, what's going to be our diagnostic approach? I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but let's see. So first of all, this is a cat having um, a seizure a starting. Sorry, I don't, know, I don't want to talk. So you, you can see he is foaming from the mouth. And now he's going to full tonic seizures. He's going to lanter recumbency, paddling. A few seconds, not very long. Um, so clinical presentation. The clinical presentation is key. If you, if we as vet professionals could see the seizures, that would be really helpful. Nowadays, owners have their phones available, so maybe they can't be the the first one because it is a quite shocking manifestation for for an owner. It is for us as well, um, and it's even worse for an owner, especially if it's affecting their pet. Um, so, but again, they they can eventually um, video them uh, if they are recurrent, so we can we can see them as well. Um, so the clinical presentation is key. If video is not available, a good description that um, we might need to guide a little bit up with asking a lot of questions, a lot of details in the description um, are really useful. The EEG, as I said before, um, is would be really really helpful if we could do an EEG, especially when the animal is seizuring, and and often also the response to anti-epileptic drugs can help with, with the diagnosis if they respond there is a high chance that the animal is, is suffering from, from seizures. And then if we can identify an underlying cause um, that can justify again um, the seizure as a clinical science. Very important is to collect um, the history. Signalment, as I said earlier, age we have seen depending on the age of the animal we can actually uh, already um, um, list the differentials, um, uh, gender, um, um, breed, as we said uh, before, there are some breed that are predisposed to idiopathic epilepsy. Make sure we know everything about toxin exposure, if the animal have other pets, if the animal has been traveling, so exposures to, to infectious agents and, and parasites. And then again, description of the episode. This is, a, this is key. And all, often, you, if you really have the time to ask the owners, they can tell you also that the animal had um, was showing abnormalities even before the actual uh, seizure, the actual, what we call the ictus, so the prodrome, the aura phase, there are all phases where the animal is showing abnormalities, can be anxious, can act clingy, um, it is not its usual self. Um, and then there are often uh, some post um clinical signs on so the animal is showing signs after 
um, once the, the main seizure is um, is finished. Um, what are the typical postictal signs? Uh, Alteramentation and ataxia, very frequent. Uh, some animals are blind or have abnormal vision. Um, normally, the signs are symmetrical because, the, especially if it's generalized seizure, because because it has involved the whole brain, um, and the gait can be abnormal, and the animal can show proprioceptive deficits. Lots of dogs also, uh, after the seizure, they are very hungry and very thirsty. Um, so I mentioned this to the owners as well, make sure they know about this. And another thing, because again, the animal are confused, uh, the orientation is abnormal and um, the vision might not be normal. What the owner shouldn't do is hugging their pet. The first thing they feel like doing is holding their pets, hugging it, making sure that they feel safe, but they can actually um, scare them and get, they can get bitten. So they need to be extremely careful um, that their pet is back to his normal level of consciousness before they do anything so abrupt, so sudden. So I often tell them during the surgery, sorry, during the seizure, to uh, so, so switch off the lights, turn off the music, make the place um, calm, um, remove anything um, that can be in the way, so chairs, stools, anything that um, the animal can bang his head against while he's um, having um, the seizure. And then they can stroke the pet just at the back, but try not to touch it, not to put hands in the mouth, nothing. Uh, and just monitor how long the seizure lasts. Because of course, if it's more than three, five minutes, then that the one they can become um, an emergency and then they need to get in touch with the vet professional. So we have, Border Collie that um, is during the postictal phase. The nurse is trying to get his attention. Yeah. But as you can see, he's confused. He doesn't know where the noise is coming from. His nice view, of course, and um, doesn't seem to show um, any ability to see actually very well. So there's certain ab abnormality in the vision. Um, again, we said the video, we mentioned it before, uh, asked the owners about trigger. Again, some animals can have seizure triggered by sound or certain type of lights. Um, time of the day, again, they were oft more often uh, appear in the, uh, at night and if they happen to rest or uh, exercise. Um, very, very important as the, as the owners to uh, keep a diary of with uh, as much information as possible. Certainly the frequency, when they happen, what time of the day, how they look like, um, as much in any relation to anything that they can think of, just put in the diary. There are some wonderful app out there for people. There's nothing uh, conclusive in that medicine, but uh, a notebook and a pen will do so they can know, write down uh, all the details of, of the seizures. This is going to be very useful because then we can monitor how the seizures, um, if, if the severity and the frequency of the seizure changes, and that, that will help us to, to, to um, adapt the treatment accordingly. Um, there's another big dog uh, having a seizure. What is going to be our clinical approach? So. Again, age of onset, very important. We do a general, general examination, especially if you suspect extracranial causes, a neuro exam. And of course, then we run further investigations. We use the acronym vitamin D. I think most of you are familiar with it, um, to list differential uh, in neurology. Uh, B is for vascular, I is for inflammatory um, infectious, T, toxic and traumatic, A, uh, anomaly, M, metabolic, the other I is for idiopathic, N, for neoplastic and nutritional, and D is for degenerative. These are the big groups of, um, of diseases that could um, cause a neurological abnormality. Um, so if the animal is less than six, six months of age, that we suspect, so on top of the list of our differentials, we put 
uh, encephalitis, especially um, especially if it's infectious um, trauma. It's a puppy, and um, some uh, congenital uh, abnormalities like portocystic shot. Um, and then we have other uh, diseases. Um, six months, six years, we said earlier, idiopathic or primary epilepsy and encephalitis more immune mediated in this, in this age range. Um, if the animal is older than six years, then we start thinking more of metabolic problems like hypoglycemia, brain tumor, or again, encephalitis. Um, the neuro exam, the interictal neuro exam can be normal or abnormal. If it is abnormal, it can be abnormal for two, for two reasons. One, if we do the neuro exam right after the seizure, in the postictal phase, there, are, there is a high chance that we find neurological abnormalities, as we have mentioned before. Um, or if there is an underlying cause that is um, uh, the underlying cause of the abnormal um, neuro exam. The key um, parts of the neuro exam, we need to do the whole neuro exam all the time, but uh, the key parts that can tell us a little bit more uh, when we examine an animal um, that has had seizures is the mentation the animal's gait, uh, postural reaction, um, the menace response, and the response to nasal stimulation. We're going to see some of this um, uh, now in, in these videos. So yeah. This dog has um, your testing proprioception. Sebastian is testing the proprioception. So the right side, you see how often he repeats the um, repositioning. Report placement. So right, right side, pretty normal. Left side, not the same. So he's withdrawing, fine, but is not repositioning his pull normally. See, he's trying again. Repeat it and repeat it and repeat it until you're happy that the response is consistent. And he's always placing support under the animal. So it doesn't have to use his weight. He can freely turn the leg, okay? And again, subnormal front limb and high limb on the left side. In normal withdrawal, okay? Um, cranial nerves is testing the palpebral. And then is gonna try Menace. <laughs> Make sure they keep their eyes open. Which is absent on the left, a normal on the right. The snoring as well. Okay, so again, it's repeating it, and there are asymmetrical signs. Nasal sensation, same doggy. Make sure you cover the eyes. <laughs> but there is a massive difference. So on the right side is not happy, on the left side is not feeling. Okay, the instrument is blunt, so it's not it's non painful. It's just testing. The sensation. Okay. Um, as further tests, um, what do we do? So, um, hematology, biochemistry uh, with electrolytes, uh, bile acid stimulations, the and ammonia are, in, are key to rule out an extracranial um, cause of, of seizures, so re in case of reactive seizures, epilepsy, and the urine analysis as well. In case these are normal, we run MRI or CT, I'll say MRI, and then CSF top. Now, make sure you do the CSF always after the MRI, okay? We need to make sure that it is no, there is no raised intracranial pressure before we um, take the CSF of the, of the pet, that it's safe to do so. Um, um, the MRI, um, 
when we do an MRI on a patient, on a neurological patient, especially when we suspect an intracranial problem, um, of course we need we need to anesthetize the pet. Um, we need to be extremely careful with the anesthesia because uh, we are anesthetizing an abnormal brain. So of course there, its response to uh, the anesthetic uh, drugs might not be as expected. Um, so. As a conclusion, in terms of uh, investigations, what the key um, information are um, the age uh, uh, onset of the first seizure that can guide us a little bit with the differentials, the type of seizure as well, and how's the neuro exam um, in between the seizure and the interictal phase um, before, of course, we run uh, further tests. Um, treatment. Um, how do we treat um, epileptic seizures? Um, so um, there are different um, opinions also because often it's a quite complex uh, choice. Unless the animal is really seizuring frequently, uh, then the, the start of the treatment depends a lot on um, how if the, the frequency is getting closer, for example, or the severity is getting worse, and also how anxious are. Uh, the owners uh, in terms of wanting their animal to be on, on treatment. So there is it's, it's a lot to, to put together. So it's, it's really the treatment is tailored to each pet and each pet and, and its um, environment. In general, we say that if there are two or more cluster seizures in one year or two or more isolated seizures in six months. So uh, this is this can be an indication to start treatments, or if the animal have uh, some severe postictal effects again. And um, in case of secondary epilepsy, uh, it's best to to use anti-epileptic uh, treatment. Um, if the if the animal is coming in on status epilepticus, um, of course we have to start treatment, and um, we need to make sure there is owner compliance in all this. Uh, the aim of the treatment, this needs to be very clear to the owners, it's not a cure, but the aim, um, especially with idiopathic epilepsy, there is, in most cases, don't uh, stop having seizures, but we need to reduce the frequency and the severity of the seizures with mm, acceptable minimum side effects for the animal. Our goal is to use one drug, so monotherapy. And overall, 70% um, of dogs respond well to anti-epileptic um, treatment. So we need to make sure that uh, there is a full compliance from the owners and collaboration and the communication is, is there with the owners in case there are any changes in the animal, animal, animal status. Um, so again, uh, recommend a diary to the owners, make sure you do blood tests before starting treatment. Um, in theory, you should do everything, also CT, um, also MRI and uh, CSF, but uh, blood tests are important, especially um, because they might have an impact on the choice of the anti-epileptic drug. And the uh, treatment options need to be discussed with the, with the owners. There is no ideal anti-epileptic drug. There are some that we use that are really, um, they work well and they the owner can uh, can give easily to their pets, but they need to be on board. Um, in the seizure, seizure diaries, there is a bit, of, there are also some templates out there, uh, but again, a pen and a notebook uh, in a very with a very organized owner will do the trick. Make sure they know to the frequency, the length, and the appearance, as we said earlier, and also the dates, uh, because that can have an impact on when we start the treatment, if we need to change the dose, and um, and make sure they know also all this. So when we start treatment, when we change doses, and um, when we do the blood test. Um, so this is just an overview. I'm not going to go through in details this this table. Um, an overview of the most common um, anti-epileptic drugs and their half life and time to see the state. As you can see, there are quite uh, differences between them. So we need to make sure that we choose them accordingly. Let's have a look at them um, a little bit in detail. So phenobarb. Phenobarb is our 
long active barbiturate, solid, uh, has been out there for a long time and we still use it and we are very happy with it. Um, if it's used within therapeutic range, phenobarbital is a good drug. Um, it gives effect control in up to 8% of dogs and is very effective as maintenance treatments. We normally start the animal on dogs on three mix per kick twice a day orally. There are different preparations, so uh, it is, um, again, a good drug to use. Uh, when do we monitor the serum levels? Normally, after we start treatment, uh, after two, three weeks, and then six weeks later, and then um, after six months. So every time we change um, the dose, we need to, again, do the blood levels two days, two weeks later, six weeks, and then every six months. Um, it is known to give um, hepatic enzyme induction. So if we um, check the hepatic enzymes um, in the blood, they are elevated, but that doesn't mean liver disease. Okay, so make sure we don't get confused with that. Uh, in, uh, therefore, the best thing to do is to do, uh, do the random past, the acid stimulation test every six, 12 months to actually check the liver function. Um, so the biological effects on the liver, uh, they are not, uh, no, there are no obvious morphological lesions on the liver. So they, they are not, um, the only effect again is the increase in ALT and ALP because of induction. There is no effect on bilirubin or bile acids, but if we use um, wrongly, the phenobarbitone, we don't monitor the blood levels and the blood concentrations are higher than 35 mic microgram per ml, then that's when we can risk the hepatotoxicity. So make sure you use within the therapeutic range and less than 35. Um, the side effects, um, again, this need to be mentioned to the owners because they will see this, quite, they happen quite often. Um, ataxia, uh, a bit of sedation, and then they can do polyura, polydipsia, and polyphagia. Make sure the owners don't start overfeeding the animal because then that will uh, change the amount of fat in their body and their weight, and that can have an impact, of course, on the on the dose of, of phenobarbitone on the phenobarbitone metabolism. So make sure they keep the animals lean and pretty much in the same weight. And then we can have some idiosyncratic uh, reactions that, um, that can have a hyperexcitability, so the opposite than sedation, acute hepatotoxicity, and the bone marrow suppression. Potassium bromide, potassium bromide has been out there probably as long as the phenobarb, um, can be used as first choice, especially in uh, um, patients that are um, liver disease. Um, or as an add-on, because it seems to have a um, synergistic effect with the phenobarbitum. So again, um, very, very useful drug. Uh, or can be used, as again, as a first intention in case the seizure frequency is, is very low, because the, the potassium bromide takes up to three months to reach uh, this, um, the effective um, blood uh, levels. So uh, again, we, it's not safe to use as a sole treatment in a dog has um, frequent seizures. The dose is between 30 and 60 mix per kick once a day. Um, make sure that uh, the chloride intake in the diet stays the same. And, and, um, and the diet as well, because this has a big impact on the metabolism of potassium bromide. And the serum levels are taken um, one and three months after the, we start the treatment or we change it, and then every six months. Um, potassium bromide, we can do loading as well, because it takes so long uh, to reach the effective blood, blood concentrations, we can do the loading. Um, what um, I recommend is 125 mix per kick per day, um, divided in three, four doses. And this one needs to be given for five days. So 125 mix per kick per day divided in three, four doses for five days. And then from the sixth day, we can start the oral maintenance dose. Um, the dog needs to be hospitalized for this because can be quite sedated. And then we can take the serum levels, which already one week 
and one month later to, to monitor the concentration. Um, side effects uh, similar to um, uh, phenobar, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, ataxia, and sedation. Please do not use it in cats, it has uh, quite um, severe reaction in cats, so it's not recommended for use in cats. Levetiracetam um, has been available uh, for the last few years. It's a really good drug. Um, it doesn't have hepatic metabolism. That's an advantage on the phenobarb. Uh, rare side effects. Um, the dose is 20 mg per cake uh, three times a day. Um, we can do a loading um, that is 16 mix per cake um, intravenously or orally, if possible. Uh, it can also be used as a pulse treatment at home. Um, it's for the owners that have pets that have um, recurrent cluster of seizures, um, which is again a one of those of uh, 60 mix per cake <clears throat> um, orally and then 20 mix per cake um, three times a day. Um, for 48 hours until after the end of the seizures. Um, the levesteracetam is um, a very good drug to use. The only downside I will say, this is what I say to the owners, is that it needs to be given three times a day because we, we need to make sure that the owners know that when they start antibiotic treatment, they need to stick to it. They need to make sure that they, they do it when they can. So they decide it needs to be given pretty much at the same time during the day. Um, so they need to decide the time uh, when, the, when they are available at home and when it's easy to give the drug to their pets. A lot of owners are not home during the day or they have um, somebody else that looks after the pets and might not be as confident to give them medications. So then so some, the limitation often of the delivery of them now is the, the, the availability of the owner to give the third dose um, in the middle of the day. Uh, gabapentin was used a lot in the past as an anti-epileptic. Now we use it a little bit less, but it is a wonderful drug for neuropathic pain. So if there is pain that comes from the nervous system, um, it, is a, it is a very good drug. Uh, the dose is 10, 20 mix per kick three times a day. And again, it was used in the past as an add-on or in case of partial seizures. It doesn't have metabolism, so... Um, it's quite excreted um, as it is, uh, but has renal elimination. So in animals that have renal disease, uh, their, their metabolism of the gabapentin can be um, different. Imipitane um, um, is, has been used as well recently. Uh, the dose is 10, 20 mix per kick twice a day. That doesn't need to monitor the serum levels, and um, it's recommended to be to avoid imipitone if an animal is, is suffering from cluster of seizure status epileptic because it's not as effective. Um, drugs like zonisamide, the, the, those range. Um, it's written um, there are there are neurologists that use it, but there are not uh, enough studies to recommend it. Um, as such, and it's quite expensive as well. And the same thing is for the pyramate. Um, the, the, the mechanism of action is not well known, and there, again, there are not insuffi sufficient studies to recommend it. Um, so use this, these drugs with care, make sure, um, yeah, if you need to. Um, Refractory patients, so there are patients that do not respond to treatment as we would like them to, and we call them refractory. Um, we need to understand why they're not responding. So make sure you sit down and you take time to sit down with the owners and try to understand what's happening. For the most common cause is the owner's compliance. Make sure they are doing what, what they have to do by sound obvious uh, or patronizing, but you need to make sure that they're giving the meds and that they, the animal is actually taking the medication. So uh, review this with them. Um, and then um, check the serum levels of the drug maybe in the sub-therapeutic range, so you might need to adjust the, the, the oral dose, make sure you've done the correct diagnosis. Is there something else that could actually cause the seizures or uh, you know, make the animal refractory? We know that intact females uh, are have more often, are more likely to have clusters of seizures, so make sure you spay 
um, the animals, and because also there is suspect that there is a genetic component behind um, idiopathic epilepsy, uh, we the, we recommend that the animals that are diagnosed with idiopathic epilepsy are kept from away from from reproduction, so the, so they are castrated or spayed. Uh, because uh, we don't want to have, again, puppies from, from these animals. Um, or and make sure also that there is no other drug interaction or problem of malabsorption of the medications. There is a diet change. We mentioned the potassium bromide that can, that can suffer from this. Um, or we are talking about refractory epilepsy. There are some patients that do not respond to the anti-epileptic treatment. We put, them, we put them on two meds, three meds, and still they do not respond, they still seizure. Um, so of course, uh, we are looking into uh, treatment options to see if we can find the magic drug that treats epilepsy, the cures, or they can reduce really um, the seizures, doesn't have side effects, it's easy to give and, and expensive, so the ideal, uh, but we haven't found it yet. Um, uh, dietary changes, uh, we're going to talk about this in a minute, and then um, in some uh, cultures they do acupuncture uh, for also for seizures, uh, we, it's, not, um, it's not something that we do routinely in that medicine for seizures. Um, neurostimulation uh, is, is described and is used in human medicine, a deep brain stimulation, also vagal nerve stimulation that is quite used in human medicine. Um, the, the people self um, medicate um, and or surgery um, following mapping so they can surgery to remove uh, the focus, the area that is causing um, or generating uh, the seizure. Um, this is a are again all uh, future future treatment options that are not used yet in in vet medicine. The only one that we use, we have started using in the last few years, is uh, the change of diet. Remember and remind the owners that the change of diet is an adjunctive tre adjunctive treatment. It's not. It does not replace the anti epileptic medications. Okay, so um, it, but they have noticed they have. But there are studies that have shown that um, a ketogenic uh, medium chain type diet uh, reduce uh, the seizure frequency per month in, epi in epileptic patients because um, this diet is able to increase the concentration of ketone in the blood and therefore uh, give uh, more fuel to the brain and also um, contribute to to the structure of uh, of the neurons um, in the brain. Um, so this is one option. So to feed the animal um, uh, this type of diet, or um, the the owners can add to to the, to the pets a normal diet, one teaspoon every ten kilo of body weight uh, twice a day of MCT oil. So it's either one or the other, no, not both of them. In conclusion, we need to make sure we do the right diagnosis when, um, when we are dealing with an animal that is seizuring. And it's very important that we talk to the owners, that we inform them, we spend time with them, and we get their compact, full compliance. Um, make sure we, get, we use the, the anti petty drugs as they should be used in the right dose and with the right monitoring. We can do a multimodal treatment, adding, again, the diet as well. Uh, and there are genetic studies um, that are trying to um, you know, try to understand uh, <clears throat> the genes behind the pathophysiology of, of seizures. So uh, again, what type of abnormalities are behind uh, the, the anatomy and the physiology of, of seizures? And also if uh, the, there seems to be um, some, why some subjects are some animals are pharmacoresistant? Why do we have refractory patients? So if there is again a genetic component behind this, um, so yeah, this is where we are at with seizures. So I have a bit of time for questions, if if you have any.
here I am. Thank you, Simona. Very... How do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> no, I'm talking to the screen. So before, so we would like to have some uh, questions, uh, but before, because we always need a little bit of time um, until the question do arrive. So just wanted to um, uh, mention that tomorrow we will not be together. And um, hi, hello, Christina. Hello, good evening to you. So tomorrow we will not have uh, a webinar. And so the next webinar, so we have now uh, slowed down a little bit the pace as I was anticipating last time. So the next webinar will be on the 7th of April, um, which I think is Thursday. It's not Wednesday, Thursday. So today is the 4th. It's Thursday, it's not Wednesday. And, and we will have uh, Kiran Borjit. Kiran is a cardiologist, a specialist in, in, in cardiology, and he will uh, present atrial fibrillation in dogs. Can we bring order to chaos? Uh, so therefore, stay tuned and take a note of the date because it will be uh, an interesting talk uh, again for um, those of you working in the general practice. Um, now, let me see whether we got questions. Um, yeah, let's, let's, um, I have a question for you because uh, to me is a bit of a mystery, uh, Simona. Um, how do you load? um the phenobarbitone how is the loading of the far before of, of the phenobarbitone yes that's a good question because i didn't say anything about it earlier um so the phenobarbitone can be loaded um as well as we i've mentioned for the potassium bromide and the and the levetiracetam as well so what we do is is that we give the animal um a dose of 18 one eight milligram per kilo um, and this total dose is divided um, in over 24 or 48 hours, depending on the level of sedation that the animal has. And once we finish, the animals should have um, should have the loading dose in its blood, so the the level con the, the blood concentration at the right level. So, and then we can take the blood levels just the day the day after, while with the oral. We normally do it two weeks later and can be done right after. So it's 18 mix per kick um, divided um, in several do doses over uh, 24, 48 hours. And do you do you check the level, the serum level of the phenobarbitone? And if if you do check the, so I think I think you guys you check the level the, yeah. the barbitone. I mean, um, uh, when is the right moment? When do you? Is there a scheme? There is a like a uh, time where you would recommend to check the phenobarbitone in the levels? past so in the past they used to uh, uh, recommend to do it right before the next dose was due so you, the animal was supposed to have the phenobarbitone at 6 p.m just before 6 p.m take the bloods and see uh, while there have been studies that have shown that this is not uh, necessary anymore so um, any time of the day would do the fluctuation shouldn't be um shouldn't be that um massive to have an impact actually on 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 the results so you say any time of the day but in terms of uh um, sorry maybe it's a really stupid question so you you start the phenobarbitone and then with a the loading dose and then at some yeah. point you want to see whether the concentration of the phenobarbitone is the right one so how many days or how many weeks after the starting of the treatment, would you check the, or do you check, do you check the the, 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 the dose? So the yeah. level in the blood? Yeah. And if you do, when? Sorry. So if you do the loading? Yeah. yeah. Because the animal should, the aim of the loading is to load the blood with enough phenobarb to be effective straight away. Okay. Okay. So you, can so check you it do it the day after. So you finish okay, your loading, yeah. and the next day you test it straight away because you ah, should okay, be there. Okay, okay. If you okay. do the oral dose, it takes normally two or three weeks okay. to reach that level. So you test the blood levels two or three weeks later. Okay. 
Okay, okay, okay. Did I answer your question? Yes, you have. <laughs> yes, you have. Um, I have another question. So uh, forgive me. Maybe I've I've missed it. So if you, because we have um, um, okay, we have before my question. We have Christina. Yeah. With a question, so maybe can you can you see the question on yes, the screen? Simona? I can. Hi, Christina. So, yeah, um, so Christina is asking, thank you, Simona, very interesting. May I ask uh, for, to follow up with the phenobarbitone, would you use the same loading dose with oro? Yes. Yes. Yes, you would, if you can give it, because sometimes they are so sedated, they might not be possible, but yes, it's the same dose. Hi, Erika. Does Purina SN work well? I don't the know. NeuroCare? The NeuroCare works well. Yeah, it is. Um, the, the downside, if I can say it with NeuroCare, well, I mentioned it for some epileptic drugs as well, is that it can be quite expensive, uh, especially if we are have a big dog. So the no, it's not a problem, but you know, some owners might be put off because of its cost, mainly. Sorry, what is the characteristic of the, this Purina SN, if I can ask, of the, the NeuroCare? Yeah, they, they have, so, oh, I can pull up my, my slides again. Um, they have some, uh, the, the specific um, support for the brain in terms of um, multi-chain triglycerides in, in it. So the, it seems to, it has proven to um, to support uh, the brain, the seizure brain, the aging brain as well. And um, it, they have shown that it does reduce the seizure frequency actually um, com compared to a placebo um, group of dogs. It was, I think it was, an, it was a study with 20 or 25 animals in it but um yeah so it, it, it we recommend it as, as, again as an add-on um to the treatment okay let's remind everyone the reason why we are here we are here to yes to follow uh, our uh, amazing webinars so if i can say it in a humble way <laughs> and then also please to donate to www dot um i don't remember now the, the the link paolo can you show the link again just giving.com slash vets for ukraine um please donate and uh, just give whatever you can because every little help um and and also share with everyone our link um just to remind because we we uh, there was a mistake in the previous slide let's see again kieran borget uh, slide for his webinar on the 7th of April, um, which is a Thursday. So atrial fibrillation in dogs, can we bring order to chaos? Thursday, 7th of April, 2022, 8 p.m. UK time, 9 p.m. Central Europe time, and 10 p.m. East Europe time. Uh, save the date and we, we will... Um, uh, we will still be here and we will do another of our webinars. Um, I have another question <laughs> for you, um, Simona. We, we surgeons, we do have to treat portosystemic shunts, okay? And, and now there is, there is a recent paper where it has not been shown any evidence in giving any anti-epileptic or Kepra uh, before the surgery of, of a shunt. Um, what is your opinion? Do you, do you agree or would you treat a dog that uh, should have surgery for a shunt? Would you start Capra 24 hours before surgery or, or you, you would, so we don't have real evidence that this works, but what is your experience? What is your opinion? The microphone is off, yeah. Is it in animals that are seizuring? No, in animals that are, uh, are, are not neurologic. So um, they have a shunt and they are prepared. So we usually prepare them for weeks in advance with antibiotics and lactulose, and then and then they go for surgery. So um, 
does it make sense to treat pre-treat them to reduce the risk of having seizures or, or, or no like the paper says i i agree with the paper i mean yeah. i would not treat a dog i don't know what you have been doing in the past and if you personally from experience have noticed uh mm any benefit from yeah. uh treating them more of course it's you guys are more experienced than us with this no, no, no. <laughs> we, don't do, we don't do it we don't do yeah. it so it's just that maybe because yeah. there are some of these dogs that really are completely normal and then after you attenuate the shunt they start seizuring and yeah. they they are really scary because sometimes we can we can lose them so and it's a question of well, what, what's happening why why is this um it's, and, it's and a difficult sorry go yeah. ahead no go ahead go ahead yeah it's a difficult call as well because um as you said these dogs already receive a good cocktail of drugs as well and i, I know that we would use we would use capra probably and not phenobarb in these cases but still um i would not add another drug to a, a, a dog that has already a, a slightly compromised metabolism uh, if it's not necessary um so and because we can do the loading because there are options to make sure that if needed an antiepileptic medication can be used pretty quickly um mm -hmm. if the animal starts seizure and they normally stay hospitalized for a while after the surgery and everything so yeah I, I agree with the paper probably i would be on the careful side and not do it unless it's necessary unless they are seizure and then yes this is for dogs and cats right yeah. For both. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So once again, click on the link and donate. If you like the if you like the webinar uh, by Simona Rodelli, please donate. Don't be uh, shy and be generous. And because we want to, you know, we we have reached the three thousand pounds, but we want more. We want more because only with with this money we can help people in difficulties in Ukraine, and we need your help to help them. So please continue to do that and continue to ask your friends to watch our webinars. We do these webinars are accessible to all our platforms: LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, on Betonia Group. Um, YouTube, um, so uh, just uh, spread the word and uh, just come along and and donate, donate because because um, every little helps and it can make a big difference for for someone that is in difficulty. So I think we don't have I don't see any other questions, uh, which means that if you oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do here? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> I, Yoko, I hello. 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 Simona. Hello. hello. <laughs> uh, I just so wanted to uh, give you guys some energy, some energy and some, some compliments as well. Because I know, Daniela, you actually couldn't share or chair this session tonight because you were double booked being on call and yet we find you there so committed to the course so yes. thank you Daniela. Yes. I have you see, I have my mobile here ready to receive receive any phone call so you see I'm with my <laughs> with my scrap you're ready so, to yeah. go just in case uh, but despite yeah, all that you're nice sharing yeah, you're yeah. sharing a fabulous uh, session with uh, Simona. Simona, thank you very much. Grazie mille for such a beautiful thank uh, you. You're uh, welcome. session. And uh, hopefully a lot of people out there are enjoying it, um, have enjoyed it, and um, have uh, picked up some uh, some good uh, tips about how to deal with epilepsy in a, in a better way going forward. And uh, yeah, now now I just just wanted to um, make make sure that you know you're not alone there speaking into the void into your cameras. Uh, there are still a lot of people following this uh, webinar series. Uh, if not live, they are they are watching it uh, on the recordings as well. And uh, we appreciate it a lot that you guys are putting so much energy and uh, enthusiasm into this appeal because it's uh, more necessary than ever than ever before. Um, I don't know if you guys have uh, uh, seen uh, the latest speech by Zelensky, uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine, 
uh, addressing the atrocities uh, that have been committed by the Russian troops who are luckily, luckily retreating in certain parts of Ukraine, but not uh, certainly not in, uh, in all parts at all. They're probably regrouping, uh, but the awful images that, uh, that keep now coming into the mainstream media about what, what has been happening there um against civilians it, it's just um it's just awful and uh, that's why we need to keep going with little appeals like this and um yeah i mean I'm, i i know i'm always focused on the money whenever i come on the show but um it it, it is our vehicle to to send our love to uh, the people in ukraine so so please um Please, everyone watching this, uh, please um, join join me in um, putting aside some some money for um, the Ukrainian people, and that's the way we show our love, right, Daniela? Right, Simona? Absolutely, because the, the only difference, as we have just seen on the screen, the only difference between us and a refugee is that we are lucky and we are sitting here uh, in our homes with our families, uh, whilst our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, they, they don't have, they can't, they can't because everything has been taken away from them. Um, and this is awful, uh, unfair, and, and against all human rights. So, and therefore, let's turn together our uh, forces and just raise our voices against the war, against these atrocities, and do donate, do donate, because uh, these little nations can make a huge difference for these people. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, can, can you imagine, we'll have a look at Paolo in the engine room is uh, showing us some uh, some latest information coming uh, from the United States looking into um, putting up a war crime tribunal um, because what is happening here is unprecedented in post-World War II history. Um, it's, 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 you know, I know that in the news broadcast and in our list of priorities, perhaps in our daily lives, we are distracted by all kinds of other things that are going on, um, and that's understandable, but hence it is important that we keep our eyes on Ukraine. What is happening there is incredible, incredibly cruel, unprecedented after World War II. And wouldn't you, if you were in that dire situation, want to know that there are some people in another country with a random profession like a veterinarian making some time free and making some some thoughts free to think about you. Um, even though, you know, it might not be a huge amount of money that we gather together, hopefully it will be a decent amount of money, but even though if it's going to be a modest amount of money that we raise through these webinars, what we do with that is bigger than the amount of money. It's it's sending a message of support. It's sending a message of hope uh, because you know it will it will make a difference. We know that we know that from speaking to our colleagues, Ukrainian veterinarians, they really really appreciate the fact that we do something and don't look away. So um, let's keep doing this. Let's keep doing this. Well said, Steiner, and thank you for uh, coming back uh, and staying with us, supporting us. I would say now, uh, let's let's uh, go back to our families because we're lucky to have them here. And but before before going leaving you, I would like to uh, dedicate, like we have done yesterday, one minute of silence to homage to people suffering in Ukraine. So please join us in this minute of silence and um, we will see you again on Thursday the 7th with our cardiologist Kiran Borjit. Bye bye everyone and good night. Thank you Kiran. Thank you Simona. Bye. Thank you. One minute of silence. Bye.